so uh, we're at the top of the hour, Johan. So I thought, say, if you're ready, then I'm ready. Uh, we can just get this uh, show on the road. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, first off, everyone, uh, welcome to the Modular Clubhouse. This has been like episode, well, gazillion, I might say. Uh, but it's probably like the 10th we're doing here on Discord. Um, today we are joined by Johan from Skull and Circuits, um, whom I've been, well, I think the first couple of times we exchanged emails was even March this year, right, Johan? Uh, something like that, I think, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Oh, that's great. Lost that's great. here somewhere. Yeah, we're already thinking about 2022, right? It is, uh, it's it's getting close, uh, extremely fast, if you ask me. It's... Um, this year has really flown by. Um, so, as always, the, the plan is quite simple. Um, Johan and I, we're going to have our uh, friendly little chat first, and then after a while, we uh, and typically that takes about 20 to 30 minutes. After that, we'll, we'll open it up for uh, the audience for Q&A, and there are two ways uh, how you can do that. You can either raise your hand if you're in the audience, um, and if you're uh, incapable or unwilling to uh, join us on stage and ask your question live, uh, feel free to ask it in the companion channel. Also, everyone, if you've got any sort of questions in the meantime or anything else, um, just drop them in the companion channel. I'll be sharing some URLs. I'll be sharing um, some, some content here and there, and maybe Johan has some things he wants to share too. So keep an eye on the companion channel in the meantime. Um, so first things first, Johan, um, as I said, uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join all of us here uh, on Discord. Um, yeah, it's great to have you. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm so, happy uh, to be here. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're happy to hear that, of course, of course. So um, let's let's just dive right in, shall we? So, so could you tell us a bit more about how you got started with music? What kind of musical uh, influences were you experiencing when you were growing up? What's your first recollection of music, maybe even? Oh, um, I've always been uh, into music. I think I started musical education when I was six. Oh, wow. Or something like that. So I played the trumpets for a while. And then when I hit puberty, that became not cool enough. So I switched to guitars. <laughs> and quite soon I was playing more with the effect pedals than the actual guitar. So I switched over to synthesizers. And I have been doing that since since then so i think that's about 30 years now or something oh great superb and what kind of so, music were you playing when you when you started with your guitar and and your uh, and your trumpet uh, it, well uh the guitar part of it, it was a bit more metal gothic uh, stuff like that uh, i i knew it i knew it it's a it's long time ago <laughs> So, uh, j just for, for those of you who haven't listened to all the recordings, I have found a common theme amongst uh, people within the Eurorack sphere uh, that they are primarily, well, or they, they previously were really big metal or punk heads. I'm still a big metal head, I, I still, I'm still consider myself a punk guy as well. And it's just crazy to see that every, every time that part of history repeats, so um, is there is there still something with that well that metal that gothic background that uh, carry that, that you carry forward in your uh, in your own music or maybe even in your instruments right now? Sure, um, it's it's always there. I still play guitar and I still still play uh, metal mostly. Uh, the music I make has heavy influences from uh, metal and from uh, gothic uh, kind of stuff. Yeah, it's something once you go, once you're a metalhead, you always stay one, I suppose. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, and I still go to a lot of concerts and a lot of metal concerts as well. So a bit of everything, um, but yeah, a good metal concert I won't skip. <laughs> so absolutely, right on, right on, and. Um, well, uh, even festivals then as well. And, and if, you, if you do, do you bring any of your gear with you to uh, festivals even? No, no, not at all. Not at all. I go to festivals, yes. Uh, the famous Graspop in Dessel. Mm -hmm, absolutely. To the, 
to the Dutch border. I visit it every year, but I take as little as I can with me because, well, it's a festival. It's, <laughs> it's, the, it's just a, a risk, of everything. course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, that's that's absolutely true. And I've uh, I've I've never been to Grasbop, unfortunately, but I've been to Wacken several times, oh, yeah. and of course Dynamo yeah, when that was still. Yeah. yeah, when 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 Dynamo was still a thing, of course. And now we're talking about metal, even though we should be talking about <laughs> about synthesizers, of course. So uh, you already mentioned that when you were playing guitar, you then found or you 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 noticed you were drawn towards the uh, the more generative, the uh, the more well modular approach of using your pedals more. So what what kind of pedals were you using back in that that time frame? Um, basically, what I could afford, it was like uh, a few boss pedals, a delay, a flanger, uh, a, bit, a few distortions. Um, but that was enough to well mm -hmm. keep me busy for a while. I just play a simple thing into a delay and then put it in a flanger and, and shift the stuff around a bit. Um, yeah, it, it was fun. I never had a big budget to uh, to mm -hmm. put towards uh, music gear, so I didn't have a huge pedal board. Uh, but I had my trusty Marshall, which I still have to this date. <laughs> uh, Great. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't see any use anymore since now the the digital emulations just sound okay to to play guitar. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I go that way, and it makes a, a lot less noise, which uh, my wife and kids uh, really like. <laughs> so. Oh, that's also uh, yeah, good point. Absolutely. <laughs> it depends on whether or not your uh, your kids and your wife appreciate your music, of course. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, and well, yeah, basically, loud guitars. Uh, in the house, well, it's fine as a teenager, but uh, yeah, indeed. Just wait until your kids are uh, at that age, right? Well, they are a bit of that age. Uh, the oldest is sixteen, so uh, oh, we have uh, we have uh, some music in the house. Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. And and, and are your um are your metal and synthesizer uh, tastes rubbing off on them, or is that still just you? A bit, a bit, a bit, a bit. My my oldest listens to a lot of um, '90s music, actually, like uh, the grunge uh, scene and stuff like that. So, oh wow, yeah, you don't hear that that Pretty often. Weird, actually, yeah. well, no, it's not so weird. It's, it's great music. Don't get me wrong, but you don't typically hear that generation really embarking upon the the early 90s and with, with, with grunge and you typically do see them well I've, I've heard of people with children in that range my my kids are much younger luckily enough and uh, where, <laughs> where they typically take on either a more of an 80s approach to the early early days of thrash metal or they go more towards the well the the, the, the late 2000s approach of metalcore but actual grunge that's great to hear absolutely that's that's no, great. That's a, great parenting, I would say. Okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but also a bit of new stuff uh, like the Brussels rap scene and stuff like that. And, yeah, of course, of course. But it's fun. She has she has good uh, tasty music, so we can go to concerts together and stuff like that. And that's great, of course. That's 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 what what a parent be. <laughs> that's what being a parent is all about, right? To to share those kind of things. So um, indeed. Yeah. So 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 let's go go a bit back to. When you made that transition from okay, well, I, I I understand where you were understanding these these pedal boards, sorry, your pedals and how they worked and how the intricacies worked. So when did you then actually make the actual well decision to say okay, I'm going to give synthesizers a try because back then synthesizers were of course with especially within within metal were a bit of a uh, of a no go area. Yeah, there were indeed. They were in metal. They were uh, very no go. But mm -hmm. uh, it was also the time of uh, new wave and and stuff like that. And from two four two was uh, yeah extremely popular in uh, in Brussels. Uh, also, Sisters of Mercy stuff like that. Of course, yeah. 
And uh, a good friend of mine had a synthesizer in a drum computer. And basically, yeah, we, we hooked up together and we're still me making music to this day together. Oh, wow. That's nice. So, yeah, that's, that's over 30 years now. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, then my interest in, in the synthesizers started. Like, when, well, that sounds fun. <laughs> so... Well, I put the guitar aside and I started with synths and buying a synth here and there and run computer and stuff like that. But budget was limited and those things were done, were very expensive. So absolutely, we kind of put things together, uh, my, my friend and I. So we had more of a studio than we could just afford on our own. And that's still the case to this day. So oh, nice. the whole studio is built in his attic now. And uh, okay, now we have a bit more money. So it's kind <laughs> of stuffed with all kind of, of things. Um, everything we, we fancy, we, we get someday. Um, and yeah, well, we still go every Monday evening. I still go there and... Uh, we have a nice, fun evening making music and doing stuff. And just jam together. And just jam together, write songs, and maybe once or twice a year we actually do a gig somewhere. Um, and that's that's about it. It's it's for the fun, and it's very enjoyable. And uh, the idea of becoming a rock star are long gone. <laughs> and... Well, you never know. Um... <laughs> We've heard of people uh, who are much older than the two of us combined that finally broke through. So yeah, you, you, who knows? Yeah, but it's not. It's you know when you're when you're fifteen, sixteen, it's like you want to be a rock star and stuff like that. And when you're forty-five, you want to enjoy a quiet evening and have some fun. And yeah, indeed, that's yeah. a whole other that's a whole other idea. And it's freeing as well because you can do what you want. You yeah. You just do your own thing and enjoy doing it. So, uh, and that's also where the Eurorack uh, began because I think a year or seven ago I I bought my first Eurorack module. So I was always looking uh, at Eurorack, uh, and I always wanted to take the plunge, but. It's very expensive to get into. Yeah, absolutely. And about seven years ago, I bit the bullet and I said, oh, well, let's gonna try that. Um, because I was a bit tired of the the classical synthesizer and the mm -hmm. typical two, vo uh, two oscillator voices and stuff like that. Yeah. So I so wanted something else, something which you can... Um, also experiment a bit more and since well we had a decent computer there so we could record audio so the the whole thing about not being uh, able to save patches and stuff like that wasn't very important anymore yeah absolutely uh, it, it used to be different when we first started out computers weren't able to to record audio yeah. um, well they were but not on multiple tracks so Everything was MIDI and everything was saved in patches and, and recalling a song was quite a nightmare. Um, and now everything gets recorded in audio um, while we write it, so we don't have mm -hmm. to save anything anymore um, because oh, it's oh, all yeah. printed in audio. Absolutely. So what were a couple of those first couple of modules you uh, you got back in that, uh, in that time frame? Well, it was... Uh, a handful of Dufour models, mm -hmm. I think uh, the typical VCO, VCF, VCA, an LFO, and a mixer, and that was it, I think. Uh, very, very simple setup, Yeah, but it quickly expanded with a bunch of uh, Erica synth uh, kits. Mm -hmm. uh, if, back in the day when they just started, they sold kits of the Polyvox. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, oscillators and filters so we got a bunch of those as well uh, and I think 
about oh well, midi 2 cv was also one of the which mm-hmm. i oh, don't use anymore actually um that was the first case and since then it just grew yeah uh, and you said you you're no, no no longer using C, uh, midi to cv um no. are you, have you have you stepped away from incorporating midi into your eurac sphere or are you using different things for that well i have a beatstep pro now which yeah. uh, basically acts as a sequencer for the for the whole rig yeah um and it gets its midi uh clock uh from the computer and that's about it um and that's enough for me at the moment yeah so, yeah, yeah yeah so essentially you just use your beat step pro as a as a midi midi to cv uh interface essentially yeah basically just i just time it with the main clock and uh then do everything from the unit itself so Oh, that's nice. It's, it's uh, I, I think it's one of the the best sequences I ever played with because it's 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 easy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it has limited functionality, but what it does, it does well. And you don't need to read a manual to to get along with it. So and you can keep everything running as well because we're always. There are two of us, and we're yeah. both working on the same song, so we can't always start and stop. So we need to have things running all the time yeah. and be able to sequence on the fly, basically. And not a lot of sequencers allow you to do that. Uh, that's true. Really that's true. enough. Re- really enough. That's uh, that's why I like my uh, Roland Air Eight, the drum computer, so much because. It allows you to do to just keep looping and and working on the drum pattern without having to start stop all the time. Yeah. So. Oh, that's that, that's but, a nice thought actually. So I I can't speak on the the Beatstep Pro because um, the only well uh, hardware sequencer in that regard that I have is the is the Key Keystep Thirty Seven, um, but I I will need to uh, give the well, the Beat Step or the Beat Step Pro, a try in the coming months. I'll uh, I'll need to make sure of that as well. And then you say, well, you're incorporating the the Roland drum computer, um, and how does that then translate to co- incorporating that into your app? Because some of your um, most well, your better known modules are, of course, uh, drum modules. Are those then triggered from the Roland uh, machine or still from the Beat Step? Still from the beat step, yeah. Okay, great. So just two sequences running in parallel, uh, sometimes three, sometimes four, because we yeah. have two beat steps. Um, we also have a key step pro, mm-hmm. um, which are basically all the sequencers run on the same master clock. Mm-hmm. And we just keep everything running. And whenever we have a device we want to control, uh, <laughs> we put a sequencer on it and there we go and you just patch it in yeah and we patch it in yeah because there are a lot of uh synthesizers as well uh, in the studio uh, mm-hmm. roland uh, juno oh, nice. uh, gp uh north lead uh, uh, day seven wave station uh, base station even an old sampler which oh, we- wow yeah, the old the old Akai sampler, you know, <laughs> back in back in two thousand, everyone had one. So we haven't sold it because it's just not worth uh, anything. I <laughs> think. <laughs> Where you just say, "Well, we'll just we'll just hang on to it to, out out of." sheer necessity and inability to sell of course yeah <laughs> basically selling it will be much more of a hassle than just keeping it around oh yeah and you, and who knows in a couple of years they might they might turn into uh literal gold you know, who knows who know, who knows who knows Absolutely. but i don't think uh, I, don't, I don't think that that will be the case but well never know never know <laughs> so then then how how did all of this uh you and your friend playing in your at in in his attic um how how did that then turn into you becoming your own uh, uh eurorack 
well maker essentially um it's a bit weird because the guy I'm, I make music with was is a technical engineer. Uh, no, uh -huh. Well, a, a, te a technician basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so every time something broke, which is fairly often, well, of course, not fairly yeah. often, but it happens. Our cables need to be made or stuff like that. He always did it himself. Yeah, it's like oh yeah. Well, so. so Oh, uh, getting to the guts of synthesizers was not something I haven't seen before. And when I started uh, my f first Eurorack, I quickly noticed that it's actually pretty simple. It's just voltages. You can do stuff with voltages. And yeah. Um, from there, I, I started just uh, tinkering around with, with stuff. And, and just trying things out. And it was surprisingly easy to find information and to find the information you need. And the basics of electronics, um, simple schematics for, for mixers, for LFOs, for a bit of everything. It's all on the internet. It's all to be found if you, if you yeah, just look course, around yeah. a bit. You'll find everything, and then it's just a, a question of figuring out and tinkering with it, and see what makes it tick. And and every module I made, everything I made, because I couldn't even call it a module at that time, mm -hmm. um, was a bit more complex than the previous one. And so after two years or something like that, I started to get a grip on, grip on how all these things worked. And I started making more and more complex modules. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I ran into uh, um, uh, Jan de Blok, uh, who organized a Belgian modular meeting. Yeah. And uh, he asked me uh, through uh, Facebook or something uh, to do a, a DIY um, uh, the Y session in, oh, nice. in on the on the Belgium uh, modular meetup, and so I I designed a vectoral filter for that, as it's it's an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's easy to solder. It's it's uh, a nice fun easy project, and you have a nice sounding filter mm -hmm. filter afterwards. Yeah, of course. So uh, I did that, um, and I. I think I sold twenty five of those. Oh, that's uh, for just one one meeting, just one meet. Yeah, the meeting. But basically, I sold ten of or something to uh, error instruments. Um, <laughs> and I thought, well, well, we have to get this legally in order. Uh, so I started a company, and then uh, it kind of grew from there. So started the website started to put things on the website and uh, it kind of mm -hmm. grew from there so so was it was so, so it was paul, it was paul Tuss who was the first one to really yeah, place indeed. that together in order oh wow yeah indeed <laughs> he, he's yeah, nice always guy, up for yeah. the yeah he's he's a great guy he's uh, uh he's he's just so energetic absolutely and so uh, before that, before you actually had that, what kind of a, what kind of modules were you building specifically? Before you said, okay, well, I just want to do this workshop. We're going to make this factual filter. Were you doing um, any anything? Because you said you were just at the at the point where you said, okay, I'm going to create a bit more complex modules. Well, I was uh, making one-off modules of that at that moment, but what I made then was the first Metallotron, yeah. uh, the first, uh, my first VCO, uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I still did it on prep board, so that wasn't uh, yeah. ideal. And also, I found the company because also I needed I needed cash to to fund if, to fund it all because it was getting quite expensive uh, to do one-off modules. If you yeah. need to go to PCB, it's it's quite it's not a terrible cost, but it all adds up. Uh, all the small orders at uh, Mauser or or yeah. all components they 
they're not very expensive, but if you start making something on Prevboard, the costs really do uh, start to add up to the yeah. point where uh, it became just too expensive. So um, that was also a reason why I funded the company to be able to sell the, to make PCBs and sell the excess. Yeah. Uh, and also a way to fund a bit uh, uh, future development of, of uh, modules. Absolutely. And, and which year are we talking about right now? I think that's two year or two years ago or something or three years ago. Yeah. And then the Not... the, the first couple of modules that were uh, commercially available, which which were that? Was that the the VCO then or the vectoral filter, the VCO? I think I've made a VCA as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, a simple buffer, uh, stuff like that. Basic, Great. pretty basic modules. Yeah. Once I got the hang of uh, a bit more the the professional design tools, well, professional uh, of Kaikat and and ordering yeah. PCBs and stuff like that, I uh, I started to to build the the bigger models like the Metallotron, mm -hmm. uh, which I already had an idea, but was only. There was only one version and it was in my rack. So yeah, that's the original one. And then of course the Metalotron 2 that's that's now still that's, commercially available, right? Yeah. That's the one who is now currently available. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And unfortunately that well that's that's the that's the one that I've uh, that's the only one that I've played with and that was one of those things when when I started my modular journey when what like wow, I was just blown away by the on the one hand, the complexity, but on the other hand, also the the hands-on immediate approach that drew me to uh, to modular, because everything that you do on the Metallotron 2 immediately influences the sound. It's not something that you can just tweak and then you have to wait until it evolves. No, it's it's immediate. And from, from what I've seen of the other modules, the, the same applies to that as well. Do you think that that's something that makes um, Skull and circuits stand apart from other Eurorack makers. I don't know. I don't know. I think that's the whole idea about Eurorack. It's it's mm -hmm. that it's hands on. Yeah. That it's pretty bare bones. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are no effects, no things to sweeten the sound, or, or it's basically a single module does what it does, and and. Uh, mm -hmm. It should be direct and should be accessible, uh, because it should. I'm, I think I'm faster in building sounds on the Eurorack system than I am on, on the classical synthesizer. Uh, and to me, most of of that uh, is due to the um, to the interface and only the interface. Yeah. And I think uh, Modeler has such a nice interface. Um, because the moment you start with patches, um, even on, on synths like, like the Juno, for example, which is an, an easy synth to use, but you recall a patch and you have no idea how it, how, uh, how it is set up. So if you want to start changing things, you have no immediate vision about how it's mm -hmm. all built up and that i like so much about your rack is like you, what you see what you see is what you get and in, in in that regard it also helps as a visual aid to start and understand sound synthesis as well because you need to understand well you need to understand some of the basics of course but then if you do want to recreate one of your patches, it's not you're not remembering, okay, well, I need to turn this dial exactly to the 10 o'clock setting. No, you need to understand things like, okay, well, how will this influence, this setting influence that sound that I was looking for? Yeah. So it's it's also an educational tool, I would say. Yes, yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, since I'm, I've am i been doing that for, I've, I've been working with synthesizers for <coughs> about 30 years, so yeah. I kind of know if I want sound, if I want an, like, say, a tree or tree-like acid sound, I, I can build the patch 
um, yeah. without hearing a thing and, and just and it will come out more or less right um, and mm-hmm. because you know how how the build where the building blocks go and and how everything is structured um, but it also it's it's also a great tool to learn about synthesis and and learn how all those things fit together and what happens when you uh, switch things around in a more in a weird fashion or something <laughs> um, so it's full of happy accidents as well um, that's and that's what we're all looking for those happy accidents and um, not really it happens but it's not not my main goal mostly I know mm-hmm. where I'm going and and how I should get there um, I think that's that's been been making music for thirty years. Uh, of course, makes yeah. you a bit like that. So, um, you want this or that kind of sound? You know which synthesizer to take of of how to make the patch to to get there. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's uh, that's also one of the reasons I I got into modular. Right, I didn't go into modular to make. Um, a lot of ambient drones or something. I I just wanted a synthesizer which could be every synthesizer. I yeah. mean, uh, where you can patch in another filter because you need the sound of, of that kind of filter. Yeah. Instead of buying every synthesizer there is, you just buy four, five, six filters. And you have a wide variety of filter sounds. And the same goes for oscillators. You buy a few oscillators from different manufacturers. Yeah. And you immediately get uh, very different sounds uh, out of your modular setup. And yeah. in fact, in that way, it's cheaper than actually buying all those alt analog synthesizers because those things aren't darn expensive <laughs> and you need to be and you need to be able to maintain them as well because of course those those all the uh, synthesizers they do tend to break down as well uh yeah i've repaired quite a few uh, during the during over the years uh, <laughs> all kind of stuff keep happening to them uh, so oh wow absolutely great and if you one th- one of the questions i had for you as well is um, if if you look at your current um, your current selection of modules that you sell on your uh, website, which would you say is the the most popular one? Um, I think it's really enough still the v- uh, the vectoral filter. Still okay, great. And then you sell that as a DIY kit or also as a pre built one. Mostly that is mostly sold as a DIY kit. I think yeah. Oh, that's nice. I think I never sold a pre-built one of those. <laughs> but it's it's an ideal project if if you want to start with uh, DIY. It's it's easy. It's easy to debug. It's uh, it's very straightforward to build. Yeah. And well, you have a nice filter. Who doesn't want a nice filter? That's I mean, well, absolutely. <laughs> so I've just I've just dropped the link to the uh, the VCF one your factual filter in the companion channel so that people can have a look at that if they uh, if they want. And then of course well, one of the the, the the most recent additions to uh, to your lineup has been the Trident. Um, yeah. when when did you release that or at least announce that? Uh, a few weeks ago I think. Um, early December something like that. It it was ready for uh, it was ready since July or something. Oh, um, nice! Yeah, but I was just debating. Like, it's a big module. It's it's like pretty wide. It's it's a lot of HP. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've tried making a smaller version. Well, it it works, uh, but I had to lose the cent returns to get it small enough. Mm-hmm. So, in the end, I just hit. Oh well, fuck it. Um, just release it as as is. Uh, I've been using it for several, uh, yeah, for close to six months now. Yeah, and I use it on almost everything because I like it so much. I mean, yeah, but it's, it it's as a... you say, it's 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 sixteen HP. It's not it's not 
ginormous or something it's 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 well, no but for what it does it's pretty big so you were aiming it's, for more like a an 8 or 10 hp size then or yeah something like that but uh yeah the problem is it 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 has a lot of uh jacks and once you start making it smaller Mm -hmm. you also start to negatively impact the usability and since it's a distortion it has to be really hands-on you really yeah. have to be able to tweak the knobs and listen and and because yeah it's like it's a distortion it's it's quickly too much yeah you need to you need to make enough. be able to uh, to to make it subtle uh but yeah. not too much yeah so you need you need easy access to them it's not something you can set and forget mm -hmm. um, you need to spend a bit of time with it to get the right sound out of it so it should be easy to to work with uh, and the bigger module makes it easier it's uh i don't i i, I understand why people always want very small modules with a lot of functionality mm -hmm as little HP as possible, mm -hmm. but often that goes uh, that goes against functionality. And uh, well, there's always uh, that trade-off, of course. And I think that if this I is trade -off, yeah, yeah, if I if I think back to the well, uh, as I said, then the Metalotron, that is, I think, an ideal density or functionality versus. Uh, uh, yeah, size. versus, versus yeah. size, yeah, absolutely. And I think that the well, the footprint that it has, and people might say, well, okay, well, that's a, how big is the Metalotron again? Let me just have a quick look at that. 12 HP? No. Uh, I think even it's wider, 16. I think. Is that 16 as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, 16 might be a bit much for a, um, uh, for your oh. cymbals, your hi-hats, but still, because of the the playability it does earn that right it does earn that footprint yeah the, like you like you said many people think from oh yeah it's just for for hyatt's so it's a bit big but well it's not just for hyatt's no it's symbols and anything <laughs> any 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 sort of metallic uh sound can get from that even the well the, those really dirty uh industrial sounds uh, as well, and that that's make that makes it that well versatile. Let let's call it that. Yeah. Yeah, the, it's it's because it's it's not a remake of uh, any existing mm -hmm. uh, hi hat some circuitry or something like that. I mean, I don't see the use in in mm -hmm. the eight or nine or nine clone or or whatever. Yeah. Um, but the circuits that are found in these drum computers are very, very optimized to make a sound uh, and offer very little way to adjust settings or to, to change the sound. Uh, if you look at uh, an 808, it's just like one or two knobs per sound. Yeah, just the decay and the, uh, and the pitch, yeah. Decay and pitch, uh, even if that, uh, mostly attack and decay or something like that. And because the circuit is built in such a way that it has little, uh, there is just little you can do to it. Mm -hmm. And what I did in the Metalotron was, well, take another step back and go, how do you synthesize a Hyatt sound? And yeah. start from there. So it's basically a whole voice in a single module it's a vca there's vcf and there's then the oscillator bank and Absolutely. there's a decay generator so it's like an all voice in in a single module so the the fun thing about that is that you aren't limited to making hyatts you can go further you can make tin cans you make can make Everything bits. <laughs> you can make a best room if you really feel uh, adventurous. You can try that. Yeah. Uh, I like I like when drum computers 
you that uh, or allow you that freedom. Very, very few do. Absolutely, mm. because as, as you say, well, you've got three oscillators, you've got your noise source, you've got VCAs, you've got filters, and everything combined, and then, well, you, the sky's the limit with that. And would you say that, that, that the same is true for the uh, can I kick it? I've, 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 I, as I said, I haven't played with that yet. Um, but from from just looking at it, I would say that that's the same philosophy behind that as well. It's the same idea, yeah. It's, it's exactly the same idea because I was making bass drums, uh, kick drums with, with, my, uh, with my modular and always ended up with the same patch, uh, sending a sine wave uh, through a VCA and modulating the pitch of the sine wave a bit and there you go. So yeah. again, I put it in, 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 a, in a module uh, and I put two of them in so you can cross uh, modulate them and well that's it and it made nice kick drum sounds <laughs> and a whole lot of other things uh, weird glitchy stuff the cross modulation does weird things so that's always fun absolutely uh, and then and if, yeah and then then the question is um as you've well unleashed the trident upon the world um, you you did well. That, like, yeah, well, there was one bit that I might call a bit of a teaser because you said that's the FX series. So that would then mean, in my uh, apprehension of that, that this is first of a series. Uh, well, yes. No, 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 no comment is also a perfectly acceptable answer. <laughs> no, I, I, I just I, I, I have different. I have the classics. I, I mean the classic series. Yeah. Just the VCS, VCOs, VCFs, stuff like that, and everything that's that's effects goes in the effects series. And and yes, there are others in the works. And uh, yeah, there are others on the site as well. Uh, I mean, there of course, are yeah. write ups of the Bit Crusher, for example, and stuff like that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. But so then, I'm working. Yeah. I'm still working on a ring modulator that should see the light of day this year somewhere. S still so. this year. So you've got three days left then. No, well, no, this year <laughs> and next year. Next year. <laughs> Sorry, I was just uh, putting you on the spot there. Um, and, and what what would be well? Uh, what's the future going to be like for uh, for Scotland Circuits? Um, how much of your time do you indeed spend? Um, in, in this company, how much of your time uh, when you divide it between your family, just music making and all the other things? Well, I still have a full time job. So it's uh, skill and circuits is something I do on the side. Yeah. And for now, that's manageable still. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I have no clue how it will go on. Uh, uh, after this, mm -hmm. I mean, in the, in the future, I've, I really have no plan and I really have no idea. I uh, never thought it would go this far as it is going right now, um, which is having a company and being able to do the basic investments to, to make, uh, uh, to keep making modules. Um, so I now have the money to buy a scope. I now have the money to make prototypes, uh, have uh, prototypes develop. I, I mean, develop my prototypes and, and buy everything I need to make them. Uh, so it's, 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 I feel like you're like a kid in a candy store. Like, <laughs> I mean, you can do anything you like. Yeah. I can do anything I like because I have some funds uh, available to do just that, uh, which is which is great. I mean, uh, I couldn't <laughs> wish for more. Uh, so, what would be next? I... What would be next for uh, for Scotland Circuits? Uh, because up until now, you've been uh, almost primarily been working with extremely well designed analog. Uh, modules. Uh, do you even consider going into digital later on as well, or will you stay 
with the modular the with the analog theme you've got right now um well the problem with digital is that i suck at programming um <laughs> that's quite honest so, of you <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i i i I know a bit of the basics, but that's mm -hmm. nowhere near enough to be able to program embedded devices. Um, I'm working on a small module based on an Arduino, uh, which is a tuner. It's a simple tuner oh, and nice. you can tune your VCOs with it. Um, and that's already pushing the limit of what I can do when it comes to programming which is downloading some stuff from GitHub and then uh, to well, make it do what, what I want it to do. Well, that that's yeah. the whole essence of programming nowadays. You need to know uh, where you can find SourceForge. You need to be able to know where to find it on GitHub and you need to find it on Stack Exchange. And if you've got that, then you're a programmer. Yeah, yeah there's <laughs> something to be said about that kind of... Uh, but yeah, if you, I really want, um, uh, I, I would like to do some digital modules, but I don't know when or what or how uh, the ideas have to be there as well. Um, I like the things uh, Emily does from Mutable Instruments. Absolutely. Um, and that's something I, I still don't have any clue how that should can be done. Um, DSP programming is, is still uh, very difficult, uh, mm -hmm. especially for someone like me who doesn't have a clue. So I don't think that's, some, that's something that's going to happen very soon, but never say never, of course. Uh, well, that's, a, that's a good point. That's a great point, absolutely. Um, but I'm, yeah. I, I am, of course, really interested to see where uh, Skull and Circus is going to uh, go um, forward. Well, with. me as well. So <laughs> yeah, I, I really don't. I'm, I mean, I started without a plan. I think I will continue without a plan, and uh, I start developing modules uh, as I s see things I like or needs I have in my current setup. Um, new models always. Uh, are born because I either see um, or have an idea for a circuit mm -hmm. or I need something in my rack uh, which annoys me or and then I go and make it instead of buying it or yeah so it's all I it's all born it. out of necessity you might say most of it is born out of necessity born out of curiosity it's uh, so yeah no, well, that, and that's I think that that's a great approach because um, as long as you stay true to what you as a as a synthesist or a uh, or a modular musician or a maybe even more specifically a Eurorack consumer, if you know what you need, then you're of course reaching a lot of people who might be running into the same into the same uh, challenge as well. And that will then, of course, open up a great, uh, well, a, uh, not, not just a great audience, but also a great amount of people that might be interested in the things that you've created. I think so. I, th I think that's the way to go. Um, because the market is so small and uh, mm -hmm. there are so, so many manufacturers out there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, that just make no sense to do it otherwise. I just do, I just made the modules I would like to have. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's it. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I don't yeah. really, I don't really let do, do marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. And do you foresee any sort of collaborations uh, with any other uh, synth or, or modular makers? That's, of course, something that we've seen well happen during this year where you might see uh, two or most, sometimes even three brands working together on a single pro product. Is that something that you have in, uh, in store for 2022 as well? Uh, not at the moment, but there is no reason that shouldn't be happening. 
happening if we find a project that needs multiple persons or or Mm -hmm. If you have an idea that 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 could work in in such a way, why not? I'm always open to do new things, so and to learn new skills and to so why not? Uh, but so far, nothing really is planned. Yeah, not nothing so, written in the stars yet. Nothing, nothing yet. But it's okay. uh, why not? Yeah, it indeed, yeah, it, absolutely. And as you said, the well, the the Eurorex uh, space as a whole has been has become quite saturated already, and you do see these uh, companies now working together more and more. And um, yeah, that's of course one of the the great things you see nowadays. So um, just because we've already been talking for almost an hour, and I still need to hand it back to the audience as well. Um, so apologies for that. First of all. Um, if you were to look at the the success you've been having with Skull and Circuits, has that ever been in your wildest dreams, or has that something where you said, "Okay, well, when you started, I know this is going to take off anyway"? Uh, no, it was no. I, I mean, it's it's. I haven't. I have started the company just to be legally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just just to make it legal, yeah. uh, s because you just can't sell stuff without paying taxes. So just to do that, and and apart from that, well, uh, it's more of an ide ideology. Um, yeah, that I I do business with a certain ideology. I think uh, things should not per se be open source, but. Things should be repairable and things should be uh, durable, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and that's why I do the things I do. Why I keep my schematics publicly available for everyone. Why yeah. I still use uh, most uh, mostly true hole components, so it's easy to um, to fix them if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. hope it will stay that way in years to come and I hope my modules will be still there in 50 years or 60 years uh, like the the synths, uh, the old synths are at the moment um, I still have uh, one of those Yen SX1000 synths in my, uh, in my <laughs> studio and the thing is as old as I am and it still works just fine so it needs some uh, it needs some maintenance from time to time but it still works so i want to create modules like that that will still work in 40 years time and stuff like that yeah as long as it just takes a little tender love and care then it can uh, it can stand the test of time i would say i hope i hope so i hope so uh, but most of the um, um, yeah, that's the reason why I make my schematics publicly available. Yeah. Because that's what you need if you want to prepare something. Even twenty years from now, uh, if you have the schematics, you can do it. Absolutely. If you yeah. don't have them, it's very tough to do. Yeah, then it's just more of a um, well, <laughs> uh, I would say, well, maybe a try and forget. You might say, yeah, trial yeah, and error. It's, yeah. it's trial and error. It's it's it's. It, could be easy, but it can be damn difficult as well. And if you have something like, I, I repaired a few of the CR78 from Roland. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice machine to work with. It's so, it's uh, it's still simple, repairable. You have the schematics. Uh, if something is wrong, you can always fix it. So. And I love that about those old machines, and and I think it's it's a shame newer machines aren't built like that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, With everything just being made smaller and smaller every time, and just uh, the the whole well the whole consumption approach to devices that that plays into that as well. Yeah, it, indeed. I I want even even big brands like like. Uh, Moog or, or something like 
Dem or Roland or Korg, they release analog uh, analog machines, but if you take a look inside them, it's all tiny, tiny SMD. You don't have any schematics. It's multi-layer, uh, multi-layer PCBs. Uh, no way you're gonna repair one of those uh, if you don't have uh, the technical manuals or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. No, that makes sense, and I do have to applaud your approach for making sure that that is open to, well, uh, to to eternity, you might say. Um, so I still have two questions for you, Johan. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, the the first que- the first of my last two questions is, <laughs> if you were to go back in time to that kid who was just getting tired of his trumpet and who was experimenting with his guitar with all of those pedals. And if you then take into account the journey that you've embarked upon since then, what would be your piece of advice to that 15, 16 year, 15 or 16 year old uh, guy back then? Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that, yeah, well, that might be a piece of advice. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. I think find, find, maybe find someone who is a bit more extrovert than you and get him along. Um, I'm an introvert by by nature, so I never really made any fuss about what I do musically uh, mm-hmm. or something. So I wasn't the guy that went looking for gigs or went and joining bands left and right. Uh, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's something I should have done. But maybe. is your your current musical partner um, is he like the same or? Yeah, we we're, we're both like that. We we're we're, mm-hmm. we're both we we're, we're not uh, commercially uh, literate. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, and, uh, and well, and, and and to be quite honest, that that's there is something to say for that as well, where you just do it for the love of music or the love of uh, sound design or the love of synthesis. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And then, of course, well, that 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 does make things a bit more pure. But at the end of the day, I do understand what you just said. Is sometimes you just need to have someone there that's capable of, well, just getting you out of your comfort zone and saying okay well this is what you uh this is what you were able to achieve yeah indeed and, and it's a combination of of uh, having the talent having the luck uh, uh having the networking uh mm-hmm. capabilities to yeah. to to get the contacts you need to have the right people listen to your stuff and, and uh, Oh well, uh, life right now, the, uh, yeah. That 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 that's 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 a great definition of life as well, right? Yeah, it's 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 with everything in life. It's, it's if you when uh, if you're uh, in a job, uh, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you need contacts. You need to know people uh, that take you for that that takes you further than. And being able to do stuff. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Um, then to tie this all off, because I I'm now bursting with all kinds of questions I do want to ask you, but I always have one very specific final question before we open it up to the audience, and that is, of course, well, um, do you have any sort of question for me? Because I've been I've been asking you all kinds of tough questions, <laughs> and now is your your turn to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to return the favor, so to say. Um, no, not really. I, I, I mean, I like what you're setting up. Oh, um, great, thanks. And uh, I know it's difficult to do in 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 the social world uh, to find people to to get get uh, get your brand out there. And I think you you do a, a great job. Oh, thanks so, so much, Johan. I do appreciate that. But I, I, I really don't have any question. No. Okay. Well, that, that's really. also that's also a perfectly fine, of course. And it's um, 
Um, just to, to add just one thing to what you just said, it is also that I'm able to do that because of people like you, uh, like the overall Eurorack community that has been so extremely welcoming and willing to support and answer my noob questions uh, as well. Because <laughs> if I if I look back, so I, I, I was just... Of course, we were at, we're at that time in, in the year where you do need to uh, do a bit of a retrospective on where you were uh, a year uh, a year ago, and I think it's it's a year ago to the day when I ordered my first synthesizer, and that was the NTS one by Korg. And oh, yeah. yeah, and and oh, <laughs> and this is where it led me since then. So it is, uh, and the only reason why that has been possible is because of the support uh, uh, from people like you, from from all of the people that are now uh, watching these videos, everyone that has joined the Discord, anyone that has uh, joined Patreon, or. or um, well, overall, the most important thing is people that like the content that uh, that I, with help from people like you, are able to uh, to create. And I hope that that part of the community will never change. Well, I hope it as well because the Eurorack community is very nice. I mean, people are helping each other all the time. Sure. Uh, everyone is very approachable. You can talk to basically... Every, there is also between manufacturers, as far as I know, not a real. Mm -hmm. There's good spirits um, among us. I know uh, Tom pretty well from Triton Modeler. Yeah. Well, you and, can say uh, hi. You can say hi, Tom, because he's in the audience right, right now. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna get him up on stage because he he immediately raised his hand. So. Hey, Tom. <laughs> How are you? All fine, all fine. You? Oh, sir, sorry. But I'm on my phone and I didn't notice that you were on speaker while um, the the interview was still going on. But now that I'm on stage, it switched to, to the regular mode. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but to to uh, go on with what Johan was saying, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of nice how it is between men factors I, uh, I couldn't agree more no well, that's great I, I love to hear that yeah that's and it's of course something that we've heard previously as well when we talk to well there are of course several brands nowadays that have been very open and official about their um, uh, their collaboration like for instance Bifaco and uh, Rebel Technologies who've joined forces uh, now of course Tip Top and Bukla who've done that as well um, and it, it it's 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 all about the the overall i might say atmosphere within the community well so far and mm -hmm. let's keep uh, so far I, I, I think everyone does bits everyone does it because they like to build synthesizers and they like to be uh, doing what they do mm -hmm. um I don't know how it's going to evolve when because the the Eurorack community is growing more and more people get into Eurorack for one reason or another um so so far that's good for everyone but uh i don't know what's going to happen when the bigger players going to enter the market uh i don't know what what bearinger will results to uh, they can produce modules on a price point uh, we just cannot match mm -hmm. um, due to the fact they can yeah they have much much better manufacturing capabilities than we do yeah so but of course the the whole well, the whole approach that Beringer has done, and and I don't want to get in, I don't want to get all political here right now. Um, but what it what it <laughs> You're does in dangerous territory now. A, a, as always, uh, and that's always when I when I whenever I hear the B word on my show, I need to step in and say, well, <laughs> let's not get all too political about this. Uh, but I do want to say one thing there, of course, and and 
um, whether you say what Behringer does is 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 deplorable, acceptable, or downright uh, well wrong, um, and wherever on that scale or spectrum you might have your uh, your convictions, um, the one positive thing I want to point out is it does add a lot of legitimacy to all the things all of the other Eurorack makers are doing. Uh, yes, and I know, yes. and I know this is thin ice. I'm, I'm, I, I'm talking about right now. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the bright side of the whole Behringer thing is that they're they're lowering the, the threshold of getting in, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I remember back when I was still messing about with guitar pedals. Uh, mm -hmm. That yeah, you buy a shitty bearing or pedal, and because that's all you can afford, and then it sucks. But you like the idea of having a decent one, and so you you throw it out, and later you buy the the real thing. Yeah, and so it's not necessarily bad for for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Although the the yeah the whole copycat thing, I uh, yeah. I understand how that sparks a lot of the. Uh, the discussions absolutely <laughs> absolutely no and that's um and that that's also i did a video on the uh, on the behringer crave that i bought uh well a couple of months back and back in that time i didn't even know what moog was let alone what a Mo mother 32 was uh but it was a gr it was a great gateway drug to get into semi-modular and uh, which would then evolve into the well, as Paul Tuss would call it, Euro crack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of addictive. It is, it is, it is, absolutely. No, and I think that that's, um, that's absolutely spot on. I do see that Noah just raised his hand as well, or their hand. Um, I've just invited you on stage as well, Noah. How are you? Great, you know. Um, yeah, so I was just going to ask, do you think the companies just... And I don't want to keep the Behringer thing going on too long here, but do you think that that Behringer um, kind of like as an entity um, is one of the reasons why more and more companies are uh, doing less open source stuff? Or do you think that's more of just a matter of things becoming like SMD um, and it's like just not practical to repair? Um, so I'm, I'm just curious about that. What are your thoughts there? Great question. Um... I think very few companies do open source um, because it just, it's kind of giving away your intellectual property. And the whole thing actually, you spend a lot of money and time on designing a circuit and you don't want people to be able to copy it. That's I think that's the reasoning behind it. Otherwise, I don't really see why. Yeah. Um, because really, in, once you have the actual unit in at hand, you can you can always reverse engineer something uh, if you really yeah. want to. It takes a lot of time and effort, but you can really do you can do it. Once with a multimeter and a scope, you can yeah. basically reverse engineer pretty much anything uh, yeah. and enough time i mean it takes a lot of time of course yeah i, I did that for uh one of the mis uh what's it called um the mangrove module um admittedly so i could kind of like diy my own a little bit uh it does take a lot of time that makes sense though i was just curious to hear your thoughts i i also agree with the sentiment that like behringer um the one upside is that they are kind of like a a gateway drug um considering that you know when a lot of people get into modular it's like oh i want this very specific module with this very specific function now there's a low chance that behringer is going to make that one but there's a high yeah. chance that behringer is going to make the neutron which is going to get you your foot in the door in the first place yeah. but yeah them them ripping off other modules not not cool you know things like the neutron nah. Yeah. Anyway, that's what, the, what, the, what a lot of people forget in the whole Behringer uh, story is that uh, Cool Audio, uh, also from uh, the Behringer group, and 
they have brought back a lot of the old uh, audio specific uh, chips as found in in countless uh, analog synths from from the past so they're now available to the the VCA chips or the oscillator chips Mm -hmm. Um, and that's partly thanks to Behringer that they are available on the market again yeah so well, think and, of that. yeah yeah and, 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 to, and to extend that well devil's advocate approach which i do appreciate you on is um well behringer gets a lot of flack for um for the copycat approach uh when you think about the the brains uh which is essentially plats if you think about the well, the um, what's it again? The Intelligel four VCO that they've that they've done, um, but they did indeed make sure that a lot of these well synthesizers of yesteryear have been brought back into the well into the mainstream because of their investment into uh, primarily British owned companies that. We're designing synths and and, and 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 chips and all of that as well, and then of course and and this is one thing I I do want to point out, uh, Ben Jordan, who um, who did a great expose on Behringer approximately a year ago, and he then pointed out, okay, well this is what happens, this is what Behringer does, and at that time he did call out one of the commitments that Be- that that Uli Behringer himself made was like okay we're going to give away x amount of synthesizers we're going to commit to um uh, investing x amount in well in, in musical education for under underprivileged children and i think that was a couple of days ago when ben released a video with an update on that on that video from from from, from a year ago where he said okay well even though Ulin Berenger followed through on all of those commitments I'll um, I'll see if I can find that video, and I'm just gonna put that in the companion channel. So even though, and I I wholly agree about the whole copycat thing, but from a, from another standpoint, you might have to well think about well what they've done there is uh, is great. Yeah, you, you might ask yourself though that if if Ben Jordan didn't leverage this whole thing on social media what would have happened good point valid and, point valid and point. Yeah. Uh, to add to that well I, i'm not going to complain that they hey did there. this it's Almost. a great thing for for people who are on the receiving end of that that charity absolutely but yeah. on the other hand there's two other things going on there they're they're kind of using that charity to kind of Compensate for deplorable behavior in the past with doing absolutely no, yeah, absolutely. Pull, and and yeah. although I completely understand that this is a marketing tactic that absolutely works, but personally, I'm not entirely sure that doing a good thing necessarily compensates for doing a, a bad thing earlier. No, no, no. Abs- I, 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 I 100% completely agree with you. Uh, Doing doing a good deed will not negate any of the deplorable things you've done previously. Um, but I, what I what I then hope, of course, is that the things we've seen Beringer do over the course of the last couple of years are indeed now something of the past. And um, yeah, time will tell, of course. And as I said, I do need to police this a bit because otherwise we are getting into a very and I and I and I'm I'm, I'm guilty of this as well because yeah. I uh, I well, was the first one. Let to, me uh... change the subject. <laughs> I have a question for Johan. It's Great, a, thanks, Tom. We, we've had discussions about in the past, and and so Johan, do, still no plans to go into SMT, man. You, you're still not tired of counting resistors by hand <laughs> <laughs> oh I'm, I'm tired of it all right yeah um but i have no real plans to go in smd at the moment now uh, not yet <laughs> oh, that's but... a pity man that's a pity <laughs> I'm not so, now, but 
Uh, I was just going to say, I absolutely love your modules. Uh, you are the complete opposite of Behringer. Uh, the Metal Atron <laughs> yeah. is very original and like one of the, my favorite things in my rack. Uh, and I'm going to get the, the kick drum one too pretty soon. So anyway, I got to run, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time, Noah. Thanks for joining. Good. And if you do get the uh, tickets, uh, make sure that you uh, film it because I'm I'm always looking for new uh, uh, can I kick it uh, content <laughs> I might say. Well, he's yeah, already I, gone. I, uh, <laughs> I suck at doing video. I know. I know. Yeah, no worries. No worries. You you might say you've got um, you've got personnel taking care of that, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> Oh, you know, the fun fact the fun fact is I am a video editor by day yeah, job. You said that, so, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I know how bad it is. Yeah. So. Johan, I, I do like the, the snarky text comments that you put on in your videos. <laughs> I, I really love them. But I just don't want videos with a lot of talking and no sound. But if you sound you cannot be talking in the meantime, so I put a bunch of text on it, but um, halfway through, I don't know what to write anymore. So it's like, you know, that's that that uh, you know that scene in one of the Monty Python films where the uh, subtitles start to tell a whole different story than what's actually going on <laughs> on the screen. And, uh, I was just thinking like about that. that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will basically watch any video Johan puts out only for for the text alone. I will already <laughs> watch it. Well, and you've been copycats uh, on that as well because if you look at the um, if you watch the the create audio uh, videos, they do the exact same thing. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I again I, I do love what the, what the create audio does in regards to opening up your rack to a whole new audience. Um, but they they did take a bit of your um, <laughs> of your trademark snarkiness in their videos, and um, again, I I can only laugh because we all need a bit more humor nowadays. Yes, indeed, it doesn't have to be all that so, it doesn't have to be that, that serious all the time. Absolutely, so. absolutely, absolutely. So again, um, have so you heard that joke that you can become a millionaire with your wreck? Uh, if you sell everything you have, or yeah, only if you were a billionaire before. <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry. You are, you already had one of the one of the questions in the uh, companion channel, Tom. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to paraphrase that or if you yeah, want to ask I'll, that I'll, you... I'll ask you. Uh, so yeah. I read the the blog post about the trident, which was very yeah. nice. Uh, but it made me wonder, though, are the frequency graphs inspired by the MS-22 calibration method, or is it coincidence that we both use the same analyzer for doing something like that? Inspired <laughs> uh, by your calibrator, no. It's, it's purely coincidence. Oh, uh, funny. And, and I might and even know, add you, something you, here, you because... Why? <laughs> Go ahead. Because those plugins are free. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The, the the paying one is also great, by the way. I I once bought the multi analyzer mm. from Melda. It's it's absolutely great for for that kind of thing. No, I was looking for an analyzer and I just found that one. And it's like, oh, really yeah, great! It's free and it was pretty good, so I stick with it. And yeah, I think I, I think I actually played a role in that as well, Johan, because I, I seem to remember, now I'm just going to look it up as well, that following my video on the Metaltron, you actually asked, well, hey, which, which plugin are you using for that? So let me just see if well, I can find it. Could be, it. could be. Could be, yeah. Let me just verify that, otherwise I might be... It will be. Somebody said, somebody, somebody pointed me in the direction of those Melda plugins, but I know, don't recall anymore... Ooh, it was. Yeah, might have been me as well, but yeah, could be. my memory is a sieve at times, so <laughs> could be. <laughs> You're still so young. Oh, uh, and it's still uh, and it's already so bad. Hmm. I fear. How, for how old future. are you, Tom? If I may ask, I I'm 35. 
Phew, I'm not the youngest one around. So, wow, that's great. So typically, well, well when we talk about Eurorack, I'm, I'm typically one of the younger guys around. And I'm, I'm 38 nowadays. And if I look at the, uh, uh, the audience ages on my channel, it's all about, it's all 40, 40 up. So it's, it's, it's always nice. Uh, I think it has to do with disposable income. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why most of my audience is from the US as well. Yeah. Because if you talk about disposable income, you don't need to be in Europe for that. No, no, no. <laughs> so I do want to open. Oh, I do see that we have some comments in the companion channel. Let's see. Um, okay, question from uh, Dual Tricks. Uh, the Metaltron, can it be found in stock in the EU somewhere? Uh, I have them in stock and Tonk has them in stock. Good question, Dual Tricks. And I can um, wholeheartedly, um, yeah, EU. So, um, um, so inside the yeah. EU, that would be basically me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can order them uh, directly from you on. Yeah, that's or great. you can order them at Tonk, but that's... Uh, outside of the EU well, nowadays. That's out, outside of the EU nowadays, and, and well, I, I hope they survive it, because um, I can only imagine it, it, would be, it will be very, very challenging for their business, because they do most of them. I think most of their business is international. Yeah. So... Yeah, what what Thonk, Thonk needs to do, and and there are a couple of these other um, Eurorack specific stores in the in the uh, UK. They just need to get uh, a hold of a well, a, an EU Central Europe, Continental Europe uh, footprint store from where they can ship to the yeah. rest of the uh, EU. Elevator Sound has recently done so, so they uh, they who? have a, an e. Elevator sound. Oh, they did. So, oh, that's great. Yeah, so it's that they're a Eurorack shop in Bristol. Yeah, and I, I believe they now have a kind of shipping location, a distribution center in Spain. Not entirely sure if it's an actual physical shop with Eurorack stuff, but they they. It's probably just a PO box. Recently started yeah. shipping from there, I mm. believe. Electric Druid to the same thing. They ship from Portugal. Mm. Mm. And it's also a UK shop. Is there anything wrong with just shipping from the Netherlands like a normal company? Uh, well, not being in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> Except from the Dutch people, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was a minefield before I threw it up, of course. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think Netherlands or Belgium going to be pretty much uh, tied head to head for the worst shipping prices ever. Um, I think so as well. So, in that regards, we are about the the worst place in the world to to start mm -hmm. a model of business. Shipping is expensive and taxes are through the roof. So, it's difficult. Yeah. Well, we all need to relocate to Malta then and just do it from there. Mm, yeah, something like that. <laughs> the weather will even be better there, so that's also a bonus. That's also a uh, true, bonus. true thing. True thing. What are we waiting for, actually? Well, the wife and kids won't approve, probably. Oh, yeah. At least in my I case. Forgot. I can't speak on your behalf, of course, but yeah. For, I forgot about those for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were just talking about synthesizers, and you immediately start to forget all of the other things that are might be. You might, just might, but... ripped them out of his happy place, yes, bro. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Apologies. Apologies. Wholeheartedly apologize. Um, so let's see if we've got any other questions because we we still have some people who are uh, listening into. Uh, three Dutch phones talking in English. So that's always fun. Yeah. So um, if, 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 if any of you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand or um, just drop them into the companion channel and we'll... Uh... Okay, well, another follow-up question from Dual Tricks. Is it sold as DIY or pre-built? Uh, both. Uh, I the Tonk will all, uh, only sell DIY kit. Uh, I sell both. 
So you can and order them. I actually right. make them when you order them. So build to spec. Build to yeah, order. Indeed. Build to order. Absolutely. So I'm just gonna share your um your store URL in the companion channel so that dual tricks can uh, have a look at that as well. Um, so that's great. Yeah. Well, well thanks for joining uh, Benji. Great of you to uh, to drop in. Um, so while we still have everyone here on the on the call right now, so what are going to be your predictions for Eurorack in 2022? That's always a good thing to talk about and to philosophize about. Hmm. My predictions. Um, I think and I hope we are going to see more and more um, um, interesting and innovative modules. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure about that. The, and I think the market will still keep growing um, as a result. Uh, I think we're headed the way of the, the guitar effect pedals. Uh, countless companies making countless different uh, pedals mm -hmm. and some pretty weird stuff. And I think we're going more in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, where smaller, uh, smaller companies actually uh, have the, the the biggest part of the market. Uh, that if you combine fantastic. them all, of course. No, but still, that's that's great. But it's not only the innovation. I think. Well, so I also believe that the, the market will still grow, um, and that there's space for small makers like ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but but what will also uh, add to this or, or help is that hopefully we'll finally get out of this uh, COVID situation <laughs> uh, with a bit of luck somewhere next year the chipocalypse will end oh and hopefully, yeah hopefully. fingers Bones crossed fingers crossed currently available and together with all of that uh, hopefully economic growth in general will will start again and, and mm -hmm. that that will lead to people having more disposable income etc so I, I think all of that uh, will help uh, the things that, that Johan already pointed out uh, and result in, in the market indeed growing further absolutely well I, I indeed hope the, the whole uh, supply chain issues are hopefully uh solved somewhere next year because at the moment it's starting to become really really problematic and i, I think for me but also for a lot of other uh, people prices are going up and availability is just not there i mean i had to order resistors from somewhere else because they weren't in stock anymore and uh, and lead times were about a few months and stuff like that. Um, also, a reason why I, uh, with digital at at, at the moment, mm -hmm. just you simply cannot find these things uh, at the moment. If you want the DSP chips, uh, waiting times are like fifty-two weeks or something like that. It's like it's insane. Absolutely. So, but on the other hand, it does. Well, you can also see it as a challenge to design with the, the, the parts that are available. Indeed. Indeed. And that's what I do. <laughs> or try to do. <laughs> but the digital, yeah, the whole digital story, this is something that's in the back of my mind and. and uh, I have a few ideas of things I want I want to do, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I if I run into a good programmer one day, uh, <laughs> we can do something together or something. I don't know. 
but I, I do think the Arduino is a good idea, Elon, because it's 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 easy for people to program because uh, you do see like the the uh, the mutable stuff um, yeah. that's absolutely excellent, but to set up that tool chain to to program one of those ARM processors. And that, that's, I, I wouldn't exactly call that straightforward. Uh, what, whereas the Arduinos, uh, you have pre-built uh, IDEs, simple ones, uh, for all the uh, operating systems. And it's, it's just mm -hmm. plug and play. And it's, it's also true that, of course, uh, these, these uh, Atomega chips that the Arduinos use, they're, they're definitely not as powerful as ARM processors, but um, yeah, it's it's all about how you use them, really. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, and and there is a bit of of, of problem. Uh, I have a, I have a few teensies here for trying out stuff and, and things like that, and and I just run into basic uh, problems. Well, they are not basic, but uh, it's like building a, a steady clock. Uh, and then how can I do keep that clock steady while at the same time updating the display and do interrupt yeah. interrupts Johan. Yes, yes, but even then I <laughs> how I like it, and uh, so <laughs> I feel my knowledge of programming is just not sufficient to. No, but that's yeah. something uh, again. That's something where I do see people joining forces i've been i've been uh talking to several very technology savvy eurorack makers and i've been talking to several like yourself who are really truly gods within the the the, the analog uh approach uh, but who do want to wade into digital as well and i do think that just like the experience you had when you first set foot in the, into the Eurorack world, I think the, the 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 most important piece of advice I can give is, well, just ask, and people will, yeah, will, of, will come to of join. Of course, it's, it's well, it's 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 uh, it's just a lot to learn, uh, just a Absolutely. lot to take in, and and that's that's just intimidating. Uh, I only programmed in high level language. Yeah. So if you go then to even Arduino, uh, which is basically C, uh, it's it's a low level language more more or less. Uh, things are very very different uh, to work with. So I I know how the canal that stuff should look like, but implementing it correctly is where the problem lies, and uh, that's a hard nut to crack. So. Yeah, also typically getting good performance out of small chips or any chip basically comes down to getting into the low level stuff, writing directly into registers and uh, things like that. Um, Indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in, in school, uh, literally translated, we call this bit fucking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, indeed, indeed, yeah, and that's where my knowledge is not that good enough. So um, while we're on the subject, any 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 considerations about look for J? Because apparently that's always the thing we need to talk about during these shows as well. About about what? Look for J. No, <laughs> the funny thing was, um, so I'm not a programmer per se, but I I I know how to program. And I, I work for a uh, an American software company. And un probably like a week and a half ago, there was this big security scare because of a an open source library that's used by every application and its mom called Log4j. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so last week, it was me and uh, Nico from uh, Likaon, uh, instruments where we first talked 15 minutes about look for J so when we talked about okay well we're not programmers but let's talk about look for J so it was just me trying to be funny sorry <laughs> did, did they end up finding J or 
Yeah, that's the question. Did they actually found Jay? That's what really interests me in this this story. That's a great question, actually, Tom. I'll I'll look into it and come back to you. Let's take this offline or any other uh, Teams or Zoom. Uh, <laughs> um, well, evasion uh, evasion tactic that I know. <laughs> Yeah, but I yeah, have but to the, agree no, with Wiggle a thousand. Uh, the look yeah. for Jay thing was quite bad, absolutely. Hmm. I do, I, uh, I do think we're going to see more and more digital uh, units. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, although so far, from what I've heard and what I've played with, uh, very few are, are gonna be good enough. Um, I recently bought a uh, FX8 uh, XL as a as a effects unit, and while it does a whole lot, um, I just can The quality of the of the reverbs just isn't there yet. Mm -hmm. so, I'm kind of happy to hear you say that because I I have this exact same unit and. Yeah, it's not bad, but I don't find myself ecstatic about it, and I was wondering if it was just me. <laughs> no, but the problem with reverbs is, um, well, you have to compare to the to the lexicon that's in the rack as well. I mean, in the outboard effects rack, and uh, the yeah, all those expensive reverb. Uh, plugins and um, yeah but, but also the, the tree controls aren't doing it for me I, I recently uh, bought a, a Strymon Big Sky at last oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and they, s they tend to be good um, I mean I yeah. really heard good things about them I'm well I have to say I'm very picky about these things eh? um, more than I should be and so I know the Strymon is good because it doesn't annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's that's what a good reverb should do. It should shouldn't be there. You shouldn't hear it. It should just exist. Work. Yeah. It should just the best reverb I, I ever. I have two of them. It's uh, the digital version of Bezicho, which the air a3 and it's from 82 or 83 somewhere late 80s i think and it has the unreal capability of sounding good with absolutely everything whatever you throw at it it will sound good and i really like this 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 machine and they're not that high quality reverbs or something, but just some something in the way they they, they do what they do that that makes them sound good, uh, whatever the source. So mm -hmm. that's how a reverb should be for me. No, I I totally understand that. That's a that, and again the. The best. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll steal that from you. Where you said, okay, the best reverb is the one you're not fully aware of is there because that that's exactly what a reverb should be. It should just add richness to to a sound, not be overly present. I would say. Or yeah, indeed, indeed. Or well, it is the sound, and that's that's the new. Uh... Mm -hmm. There's a new way in ambient with uh, indeed with the big skies and and the uh, shimmer reverbs and uh, which is well then then it's no longer uh, uh, an atmospheric effect it's just it is the sound uh, it is what it is source. yeah yeah and I like those sounds but I I have difficulty to use them musically. Uh, Unless you make ambient, of course, then it's a that's a different perfect. thing, yeah. 
Yeah. Anecdotally, I had so much fun when I just got the the big sky. Uh, my my headset for work is also plugged into the same mixing board, and and that microphone into the choral reverb, that is so much fun. Even if you can't <laughs> sing for, if your life depended on it, it sounds so good. <laughs> I like yeah, that. that that's fun. And noodling around with tons of reverb are always fun. Always fun. And that's that's why I do use the, the Evictate. Uh, just if I need those washy reverbs and scapes or something, uh, then I patch it in uh, to make something airy, to make something like that. But that's, so of course, you, that's, of course, uh, the beauty of, of, of Eurorack and synthesizers in general, where you can do that. Yeah, you you can you can make you can bring the reverb in front of the chain, uh, for example, and still put it to through a filter afterwards. VC. That's the beauty of your rack for me. It's that you can do such things. Very few synthesizers allow you to do that kind of. Yeah, sure thing. So, absolutely. But then again, I uh, do have to say we're already three quarters of an hour past the <laughs> the official end time of the show. So, um, no, okay. let's let's let's. <laughs> yeah, I do have to apologise to you, Johan. I know that I'm, <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm keeping you from from um, the other distraction, which apparently, based on Tom, I should not be allowed to point out. AKA your wife and kids, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say, well, I, I truly appreciate it, and I enjoyed, and I probably haven't laughed laughed as loud during a show as we've done today. So I do want to thank you again uh, for your time and and joining us. Um, so what I do want to do is I want to thank everyone for uh, listening in to this show um, whether you're listening to this live whether you're listening to, to the recording that we're going to release on, on YouTube um, again this is of course the reason why we do this we want to make sure that we offer an enjoyable content for the Eurorack or synthesizer or synthesis community in general uh, so that being said uh, thanks so much for your time I would, and I would no like problem. to say, well, Johan, if you've got any closing comments, the, the floor is yours. No, not really. I'm not good in closing comments. Uh, <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> we're, we're all amongst so, friends here. Let's, let's, uh, let's just say thank you for having me and thank you for doing this kind of, of thing uh, in the first place. I mean, uh, it's, it's great. Uh, there that there are so many places where the Eurora community comes together and uh, how the internet allows us to have something like a Eurora community in in the first place otherwise uh, I don't think without the internet um, Eurora wouldn't be where we're this today absolutely uh, it's as simple as that uh, and uh, uh, going forward you're no longer allowed to say you're not that that good at closing comments so thank you very much Johan <laughs> and uh, Tom of course oh, also thanks for joining I, I do ha absolutely appreciate you joining in on the on the conversation and the discussions um, again yeah, my pleasure it was fun I said this has been a, um, a presentation by the modular Cl uh, clubhouse uh, please feel free to uh, join us on discord on YouTube or on any of the social uh, media outlets that you might find us on um, it's been my pleasure to entertain you for this approximately one hour and three quarters of an hour so one hour 45 minutes uh, of your time I would say please everyone uh, we're approaching the end of 2021 this has been a bit of a mixed bag for me personally. On the one hand, of course, we're still on the COVID. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, 2021 has been the year of the genesis of this channel, of this Discord server, of this whole community. So I, uh, I will always make sure that it's always going to be positive notes in my uh, bag for uh, 2021. Uh, that being said, 
let's make sure that 2022 will be even better. Let's make sure that we're all healthier, safer, um, more at ease, and hopefully um, without COVID going forward. Uh, so that being said, until that time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you for my next show next week. Thanks so much. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.